Jesus parables and sayings of Jesus. So um, without further ado, Lord, thank you for Claire. And uh, would you give us receptive hearts to hear all that you're saying to us through her this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. You all okay? Right, so we are carrying on in this series on, G- on Jesus, what Jesus said in some of the parables. And yeah, it's called Jesus Talk. And we're going to cover today some of the parables that he used to talk about the end of the world. So we're going to talk a bit about the end of the world today. I found this um, little slide. I thought that's quite a presumptuous prediction, isn't it? Now, if you were brought up in the 1970s like I was, you might remember that there were a lot of predictions flying around in the 70s about the end of the world. And in fact, I was in a generation of Christians in church who were brought up with quite a lot of talk about the end of the world. We used to sing songs about it, believe it or not. I wish we'd all been ready, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, we went to see a film in the Colston Hall called The Thief in the Night. Anyone remember that film? scary film, made us all feel a bit scared, like, you know, at any moment Jesus might come and snatch everybody in the middle of the night. There was a lot of talk around that. Now, I think all of that has kind of died down a bit, and we don't talk so much about those things. You do get the odd person. We used to listen to this radio show in America called, um, by a guy called Harold Camping. You might remember him a few years ago. He was absolutely predicting the date, and then the date passed, and he predicted another one. And, you know, there's, Christians have throughout the ages tried to work out when's it going to happen when is it going to happen? And Jesus, you know, he did talk about it. So we're actually going to just whiz through a few of the parables that, that indicated that G, uh, we're talking about the end of the world or talking about his return, more, than, more about his return, which was equated with this idea of the end of everything. So have a look at this, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Um, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. There's a, a little image there that, that of this. This is a painting um, painted in. Oh, if you just whiz through this thingy, sorry. <laughs> um, this is a very eerie image painted in the 1870s by Felician Rope, who who um, painted the 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 person sowing seeds, an enemy sowing seeds in a farmer's field to sabotage the farmer's crop. And so the question that the servants ask the farmer is, should we pull them up? And the farmer says, no, at the end of things, at the harvest time, there'll be a reckoning, we'll, there'll be a separation. That very eerie painting is from 1870 by a painter called Felician Ropp, and it just conjures up this idea that something secret going on behind the scenes, a bit underhand, spoiling the harvest, but there'll be a time of reckoning. He talks about the parable of the talents, such a familiar story that we talk about sometimes about how to invest your time, what you're investing your life into. And Jesus, obviously, in the parable of the talents, is saying that there's going to come a time when this master returns to ask his servants, what have you been doing with the investment I made in you? And one of them hasn't done a great job because he fears his master. And and Jesus saying, you know, there's going to come a time when things will be weighed up. And the the fruit and the of your life will be weighed up in this accounting. He talks about the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, or the wise and the foolish bridesmaids, a group of women waiting for the bridegroom to appear again. Jesus in the center of this story, a time when this bridegroom will return, and um, there's five women who are ready and five who are not. That's I'm not going to go into that story, but. Again, these things have been painted and painted over the ages. They're stories that fascinate us. And in that story, you know, these women that fall asleep, they're not ready for when the bridegroom returns. And they're excluded from this time of reckoning, this time when things will be kind of come out into the open. The person around whom they are centered appears on the scene. And Jesus, again, putting himself in the story and really raising this idea that you're supposed to be ready, ready for it to happen. And yet Christians over the ages struggled, have struggled to know when this thing that we're supposed to be ready for. So what are we supposed to do? How do you get ready? I'm just going to read another story. But Jesus actually says that 
you know, in the parable of the fig tree, which is, the, which is another story, the same sort of thing. He says, when this fig tree comes into bud, you know that summer is near. It puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. He's saying to you that, you know, there's something to look at, something to be aware of as we look towards this end time. And yet, we don't know when it's going to be. And when Jesus meets up with the disciples, one of the last occasions he sees them, he says, it's not for you to know the times or the dates set by the Father, but you stay in Jerusalem and wait till you're clothed with power and then go out and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So I think Jesus is giving us a kind of an idea of, of being ready, but we don't know when it is. <laughs> And what are we supposed to do in these in-between times? How are we supposed to be? How are you supposed to be in your life right now? Just thinking, well, I trust God and I'm just getting on with my little life. Or are you supposed to be awake, aware, watchful? We're just going to read the parable of the watchful servants, it's called. And here is this, in some ways, I think this parable for me sums up some of those ideas. So let's read this. It's in Luke. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. We'll have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards the daybreak. So again, another story that speaks of the return of this master whom Jesus is implying is him. And that's the reason why these stories are so subversive and upsetting, because suddenly from this kind of narrative that, was, that would have been portrayed, the sort of religious narrative would be one day God will come, the Messiah will come and he'll sort everything out and, and God's world will be put to rights. But for somebody to stand up in the middle of these crowds and start sort of putting himself in the story, it was contentious and it was very upsetting, <laughs> as you can imagine. But let's look at this um, parable. So the first thing that it says is that we have your lamps lit, be ready and dressed, dressed and ready. So what does that mean for you? Do you think you are? Is your lamp lit? Is it burning? Jesus on another occasion, another parable says that to have your lamp lit is, he says, don't hide it under a bowl, put it out on a lampstand. And then he goes on to say, and do good deeds, do good deeds on the earth so that people will look at your life and glorify God in heaven. So, so Jesus' perspective on having a lamp lit is not necessarily pouring over, you know, scriptures, times, trying to interpret dates, trying to work it out. Having a lamp lit is doing what servants do. You know, I think there's a bit of a there's been a bit of a tension in Christian circles over the years around should you get ready for the kingdom of God and should you know when it's going to be for the end of the world? Should you try and predict it? Or should you just not think about it? And Jesus, I think, is saying here, you know, you just got to do what servants do. You just do do the stuff. It's not about getting ready for his return. It's about being a servant and doing what you're meant to be doing. But the context of when he starts to talk about this parable, it's interesting to me. Just before, there are two other stories. One is the parable of the rich fool. The parable of the rich fool tells of a of a person, a farmer, who realizes he's going to have a bumper crop and he wants to grow, he wants to build bigger barns. He he plans to build bigger barns to keep his crop um, for the next season. And one night God comes to him and says, you fool, tonight you're going to die. Where is all your riches going to have you then? What's, What's your future looking like now? Because actually the greater truth in your life is that you're going to die tonight. What are you going to do with what's been invested in your life? That parable of the ritual, Jesus is homing in on greed, isn't he? And he's homing in on one of our great loves, things, possessions, our money, the things that we think will give us stability in an unsteady world. 
And he's the, other, the next, very next, hot on the heels of that, he speaks about not worrying, being anxious. Are you a worrier? Are you an anxious person? Lots of us are. You know, a third, it's estimated that about a third of our population are on anti-anxiety medication. We are a worrying race (laughs) all around the world. The World Health Organization recently did a study on mental health and basically concluded the world is mentally ill. These are desperate times and it's not surprising because our world is rocking and shaking and creaking at the seams. Wars, as Jesus said, and rumors of wars. And suddenly, sometimes these stories come right into our midst in the midst of, with Azim's story. And we realize again, our world is in turmoil. It's in difficulties and it makes us anxious. And here's Jesus saying, don't worry. You know, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, about your money. Right on the back of this story of the rich fool, don't be worried. And I think Jesus is saying these two great tensions come at the human soul and they make us, they, what they do is they put us to sleep. If we're really honest, there's nothing quite like anxiety or an, a, a fear about the future to divert us from thinking about what God is doing in our lives and just thinking about ourselves. It draws our vision and our gaze down to the tiny little things that we can control in our lives. Is that like that for you? The two great tensions that pull at us, the love of money, the desire to have more stuff, and then the fear that we haven't got enough stuff. And then Jesus comes right in the middle of this discourse and he, just, and he says this, this story about these servants. Don't fall asleep, he's saying. And he's saying it because, of course, there's a distinct possibility that we will. And you might be today. You might realize, oh, I've fallen asleep while I've been worrying about this or chasing after this. I've actually lost sight of what God is doing in the world. And there's a call for us. I think the world is in desperate need of people who are awake, alert, aware of what God is doing. And I want to encourage you, if there's one outcome from this today, I'd love to encourage you, be saying to God this week, what are you doing? What are you doing in the world? What are you doing in my world, amongst the people that I know? What are you doing in my family? I want to know what you're doing, and I want to be awake to your plans and purposes. What does it look like to be awake? Sometimes it looks like this. A friend of mine who, swimming in a swimming bath a couple of weeks ago, swimming alongside, peacefully trying to get away from everything and having her own little time in the swimming pool, suddenly she becomes aware of a person swimming alongside her and she feels the tug of the Holy Spirit as if to say, talk to her. So she starts, she strikes up a conversation as they're doing breaststroke. And... um, They start to talk, and before the end of their swim, she's praying for her in the swimming pool while they're still there in the water. And, you know, this is a person who a year ago didn't know God. But something has awakened in her. And what what she's doing constantly is saying, what are you doing? What are you doing, God? Obviously, that's not the only way to be awake. Some people are awake because they've got integrity in their workplace because they know that they're representing God wherever they are. It's not just about evangelism. It's, 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 it's about being a person who loves, who cares. All these things that we have been talking about, campaigning for justice, this is about being an awake, alert people. Let's really stay on it. The second thing that just struck me in the, this parable is, is the, what, the strange reversal of the, what happens when this master returns from his trip. He finally comes home. And did you notice what it said? It says that he will sit the servants down. He will dress himself to serve and then he'll serve them. Now that's not, that's not the right order of things, is it? That's another subversive thing that would have been most weird to the people Um, listening to it of course it would we got the sort of benefit of hindsight and we know that Jesus said the son of man came not to be served but to serve and he calls us into serving others and we know about the upside down kingdom that we call it sometimes now where God invites ordinary human beings to partner with him remember when Jesus said I no longer call you servants I'm going to call you friends because servants don't know what the master's doing. So again, it's this implication of you, you, 
you may well know something of what God is doing and I'm inviting you into partnership. And I think that we, we are called to be people who, who think about the times that we're in and have an awareness that God has got a plan that is unfolding and things are happening. You were just saying um, that, you know, we think this, this situation, there's hope for this situation, that things are going to change in Syria. We're not thinking that this is, de this is the end. We have hope because that's what we're invited to partner with God. And then what do you think is happening in the world? If you look around the world at the moment, it's hard, isn't it? There's trouble. <laughs> That's it. There's trouble. There's trouble on every shore. There's war and there's suffering on a grand scale. There's so much pain, so much shaking. The political scene in so many different countries, shaking. People that we, we question their leadership in great positions of power. It's hard, our world is. And maybe it hasn't always, sometimes it sort of comes and goes a little bit, doesn't it? If you were around in the 90s and the 80s when the Berlin Wall came down and some good things happened in the world, it felt like, oh, things are getting better. And now we're back into this place of turmoil, which is exactly what Jesus said would happen, wars and rumors of wars. Those things are happening in our world. What do you think is happening in Bristol at the moment? Well, I actually think when I was thinking about this today, I was thinking Bristol's in this sort of time of favour, I think. You know, our city, this is a wonderful city to live in. And if you're a visitor here today, you're so lucky to be here because this is such a brilliant place to live. And we're enjoying Bristol at the moment, even though actually across Bristol there are tensions. There is poverty alongside the riches. But there's a time of blessing and favour. The church is working together. And the church is united. And we're loving one another. There's some brilliant things happening. The food banks. I was chatting to Matt Dobson, who runs the North Bristol Food Bank. And he was saying unprecedented numbers of people are coming in and asking about God. They've prayed with more people in the last two months than they've prayed for months and months and months. And he was telling me about a person who came in and said, I just want to come back and see what, who you all are, that you would do this. She's now in church. She's being baptized. You know, there are stories of things. It's like a rumbling on the ground. And that's the thing I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to say today is I think we're in a season of openness to the gospel. And I think it's a bit unprecedented in my lifetime. I think there's a, something going on outside the church. Sometimes we talk about revival and really what we mean is renewal. The church is waking up and things are looking good and we're singing more enthusiastically. But actually what's really on God's heart is the lost, is people who don't know him yet. And it feels that there is an awakening outside the church at the moment. And there's lots of people. I was just talking to a lady from the previous service who comes from Cornwall and she said it feels like Cornwall is waking up. We were in a minister's meeting about a month ago with about 50 or so ministers in the room from around Bristol in this region and story after story of people saying, people are wandering into churches asking questions. Maybe today you're one of them and you might be somebody who's come here today and you're kind of wondering, what is it all about? Something in you might be waking up. And we want to say to you that you're really welcome to travel with us on that journey. We want to be awake too to what God is doing and to know him more and to love him. And so anyone is welcome here. But I think that is what is happening. A friend of mine was standing outside a venue of ours in Stokes Croft where a Christian worship gathering was happening. And a few people were wandering by. One lady came in and she just came and she said, can I come and look at what this is not a not a lady who would call herself a christian and she just said this atmosphere is electric what is this just worship that's all it was another two ladies walked past and this friend of mine felt to just it just engage them in conversation and he felt again a bit of the tug of the holy spirit saying something to him about one of the women and he said do you mind if i just share something that i feel god has said to me for you and she went okay and um, so he just said a quick prayer. And then he said, I feel like God is saying, I'm going to give you a double portion of life. 
And this woman started to laugh and then started to cry and said, I've just had a scan today, my first baby, and it's, the, it's twins. <laughs> and she, <laughs> yes, nice, isn't it? That's, but you know, that's what it, in some, some ways, that's what it looks like to be awake, to sort of catch something of the heart of God, which is so often engaged with people outside the church. And if we want to be in on the plans, alert to what God is doing, that's something that we really have to recognize, that God's heart is for the outsider, for the lost. And you, wherever you are, you're like a, a kind of front line of mission, wherever you are, whether it's something quiet in your family and your immediate family around your friends there may be some people that God's put on your heart over the years and I just want to encourage you that God is doing something at the moment and join in I want to encourage you to step out and take a few risks that you might not normally do and I think this little thing in the parable where Jesus is saying the master will come and sit and serve you is, is a kind of just an indicator. This is what it's like in the kingdom of God, Jesus is saying. God is on board with you. He is serving you as you work on his behalf. It's this mutual serving. It's beautiful. And this parable finishes, actually, with Jesus sort of re-emphasizing, you don't know when the end is. You don't actually know. It could be in the middle of the night, he says in the parable, or it could be just before morning. And sometimes it, it does feel like we get very close to the end, doesn't it? It feels like the pain in the world is just too much. And then other times it backs off. And, you know, we don't know. All we know is it's totally in the hands of God. But central to our belief and understanding of our faith is that he will come again. Jesus will come again. We say every time we do communion, he's coming again. And we are supposed to long for it, anticipate it. But the main way we anticipate it is not by predicting or planning. It's actually, it's, it's what we carry in the meantime. That moment of the end is not the point. It's what we're carrying now. What are you carrying now of the kingdom of God? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or dates to the disciples, but while you're waiting, be clothed with power. That's for you today. That would be a good way to end this talk, would be for us to stand and ask God to clothe us with power. We're coming towards Pentecost in a few weeks. That's where we celebrate that clothing of power that is now ongoing and is available to each one of us every day. You know, you don't really have your yesterday and you haven't actually got tomorrow. You just got today. How are you partnering with, with God and how are you anticipating <coughs> his return. I'll just finish with a little story, another one of somebody just catching a moment with God, just um, unexpectedly. And this is a friend of mine, Gwyneth, coming out of her front door, coming out onto the pavement, witnessed a drug deal happening before her eyes, just outside her house. And it just stirred up a, an anger in her. And she, without hardly thinking, just stormed in to give the drug dealer a talking to. And as she, she's a very little lady, and she, but she's got a, packs a punch. She didn't punch him. Um, she, when the, the, there were two lads there that were being dealt to, and they slunk off when she approached, she was left there with this six foot two drug dealer. And she just gave him a piece of her mind. She felt like a mother, she said. And in fact, as she was speaking, she felt the Holy Spirit say something to her about his inheritance. And she said to him, this is not your inheritance. This is not what your mother and grandmother planned for you. And uh, she sort of tore him off a few strips and, and sort of came to an end. He said, okay, okay, fair enough. I won't deal on your street anymore. And drove off. And uh, she was a bit like, mm, great. That's, you know, okay, good, partly good outcome. A month later, she was coming out of her front door and walking along the pavement, and a car screeched to a halt next to her, and she recognized the car. And then this guy jumps out, and she recognized him, and he was coming at her, and she was terrified. She was thinking, he's going to come and tell me I've lost all this money because of you. But actually, when he got to her, he just said this. He said, can I give you a hug? 
And she, he gave her a massive hug and started to cry. And he said to her, you know, when you started to say that thing about inheritance, he said, I just knew you were totally right. Because you're right, my mother and grandmother, that is this not how, what they planned for me. And in fact, I've been estranged from my mother for 12 years and I've been dealing drugs for 12 years. But because of what you said, I'm stopping dealing drugs and I've reconciled to my mum. Now, <laughs> you know, when I heard that story, you, she would be the first person to say, I'm just an ordinary follower of Jesus. But I just thought, that is Christianity. It's supposed to look like that. Ordinary people like you and me, clothed with power, ready for what God is doing, knowing the season that we're in, and knowing that one day, however hard it is, he's coming again. And that is our ultimate hope. Amen.